our scientific day. My name is Dina Mitwali, and I'll be the moderator of this session. The session will last for about one hour and 45 minutes. It consists of three lectures followed by live discussion of, with our speakers and panelists. Dear attendee, if you have any questions uh, regarding the talks at any time, you can submit your questions in the radiology chat box present in the lower right corner of your screen, and it will be answered at the end of the session. I'm honored to introduce our special panelists of the session. In alphabetical order, they are Dr. Hanan Buifel, Associate Professor of Radiology and Dean of Faculty of Applied Health Science at Mast University. Dr. Nermin Sulaiman, Professor of Radiology, Mansoura University. Dr. Rawia Fauzi, Professor of Radiology in Research Institute affiliated to Alexandria University. Dr. Sharif Hegeb, Professor of Radiology in Alexandria University. I hope you all to enjoy our session. Dear Dr. Hanan, you may start the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Dina. It gives me really a great pleasure to be inviting as the chairperson in this session um, thank you very much for the organizing committee and a special thanks for my dear colleague, Dr. Iman Awis. Our first speaker, uh, Dr. Shilpa Alad, uh, she's an eminent consultant radiologist for breast imaging and intervention at NM Medical Center, Mumbai, India. She also subspecialized in breast imaging and the College of Radiological Imaging, former staff radiologist and assistant professors at Women's Breast Health Center at Ottawa Hospital, University of Ottawa, Canada. She is also a distinguished teacher for under undergraduate medical education and nominated best re residency program teacher at University of Ottawa, Canada during 2011-2012. Uh, I'm really honored also to share this session with the professor uh, Rawia Izzat and Professor Nermin Suleiman and Professor Sharif Hagab. Um, Dr. Rawia, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm greatly honored to be with you today. And I have to start to, uh, uh, to congratulate Dr. Arasha and the organizing committee for all they did I hope uh, the session will be uh, fruitful. Um, and now we are going to uh, present uh, Professor Dr. Shilba. She's going to give us uh, two lectures. The first one will be on 3D tomosynthesis case based review. And the second will be film reading session. Please, Dr. Rashilba. Yes. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Uh, so at the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, my dear friend, Meritel Madhvi and Rasha Kamal. And um, I would also like to thank um, Dr. Professor Hashem Al-Ghazali, Dr. Nermeen Mustafa, uh, all the uh, eminent uh, panelists and moderators for this session and every single participant from across the globe, uh, in Egypt, Middle East, Africa, India, um, wherever you're joining from, um, I would like to say thank you for being here. Um, and without further ado, uh, let's start with our first talk, 3D tomosynthesis, okay? And this is going to be a case-based review, like we see things when we are at work, okay? And what are those things that we see? Before I start, let me give this a disclaimer. I work as a KOL for Fujifilm India and for Bard India. And um, um, my um, uh, first and foremost uh, gratitude and uh, uh, my respect to my uh, 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 Sadhguru, um, Sadhguru Shri Vaman Rao Pai, because of whom I am. Uh, so uh, um, with this, let's start with our talk. To, uh, the objective of this talk is to highlight the signs of benign versus malignant breast lesions as we see on 3D tomosynthesis versus 2D mammogram. What are those findings that should make us look again? That is what we are going to see in the next few cases. We are also going to see a couple of cases of S view. Why? Because there is so much talk about radiation, 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 and the fact that it is like doing two mammograms, the 3D tomosynthesis 
plus the 2D mammogram. So is there a way out is the question we will try to answer. Okay. So what are the factors that affect lesion detection on a 2D mammogram? There are patient factors and there are technology factors. What is the patient factor? The patient factor is the breast density. All women do not have the same breast density. Unlike when we scan the liver or the kidneys, everything looks the same. Where in the breast, it is a combination of fat and fibroglandular tissue. And because of the variable amounts of fat versus fibroglandular tissue, lesions can hide despite of being there. Okay. And in denser breasts, there is lesser detection rate where, as compared to a fatty breast. Okay. But that is about to change. I'll show you a couple of cases which are like eye openers for all of us. And then there is the technology factor. With a 2D mammogram, what we are trying to do is acquire a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional structure, okay? Therefore, there is superimposition of breast tissue. Everything is stacked one below the other, okay? And therefore, what is not a cancer looks like a cancer, and what is a cancer is not seen because it hides behind the fibroglandular tissue. So how do we overcome that? Scenario one, this is a patient who's, uh, who came for a screening mammogram. She's 60 years. She's postmenopausal. The breast does not look that dense, right? It looks like a good combination of fat and fibroglandular tissue. When we do the first read, do we see any abnormality? Are we seeing any microcalcification? No. Are we seeing any architectural distortion? Not really. Are we seeing any masses? No. Are we seeing any focal asymmetries or asymmetries? I am not confident that I'm seeing any of those when I look at it at the first go on the mammogram. However, when I look at 3D tomosynthesis, my perception changes. And why does it change? What are the things that bring my attention to a particular spot on 3D tomosynthesis? Here is that thing, okay? When I do a 3D tomosynthesis, this is what I see in the right breast on the MLO view. In this particular spot, I start seeing a mass. Mass means it has outer convex borders, but also surrounding the mass, I'm seeing peripheral speculation, those little lines that are coming out from the mass, okay? And I see it on slice number 25. I typically don't like to show the entire video when I'm doing the, doing the talk because it takes away from the attention. And I like to show the pertinent images so that we can focus on the findings, okay? So this is what we saw. We start seeing a mass with peripheral speculation. When we see in retrospect, are we able to see it? Yes. When we see in retrospect on the 2D mammogram, perhaps that mass was there. Okay. But we see it better simply because of these peripheral speculations that we are seeing on the 3D view on slice number 25. Okay. Ultrasound was performed and it corresponds to this irregular hypoechoic solid mass with posterior shadowing. Ultrasound biopsy was in keeping with an invasive ductal carcinoma. Okay, so peripheral speculation. So from now on, in the next few cases that we are going to see, what are we going to focus on? Are we seeing any peripheral speculation? Okay, so train your eyes to look for those. Next case, 41-year-old, premenopausal, she again comes for a screening mammogram. Are we seeing any abnormality? Is the breast very dense? Not really. The breast is not very dense. It is predominantly fatty with a... Uh, with a some fibroglandular tissue. However, in the right breast, in the upper outer quadrant, we are seeing this focal asymmetry. Now, is this concerning or is this not concerning? Am I seeing peripheral speculations? It almost seems like that in the CC projection. They look like peripheral speculation. So what do I do? I look at the 3D tomosynthesis. Slice by slice by slice by slice. When I look through the entire stack of images, what do I see? On one of the slices, on a few of the slices, this entire thing opens up. I do not see any more peripheral speculation. Are you seeing the same lines that we saw on the 2D view, in the 3D view? No, the lines start opening up. Why? Because it is just superimposition of tissue, what we call summation artifact, okay? And we are seeing it best on one particular slice, slice number 49 of 79 slices, okay? Ultrasound also corresponds to normal fibroglandular tissue in this area. So absence of peripheral speculations on tomosynthesis gives me an idea that I might be dealing with a summation artifact from superimposed normal fibroglandular tissue, okay? 
nonetheless focus ultrasound was also performed in this and in the entire upper outer quadrant all we see is normal fibroglandular tissue next another case again a premenopausal who comes for a screening mammogram what do i see on the screening mammogram it's a nice beautiful predominantly fatty breast correct but despite of that in around the 12 o'clock position of the right breast i am seeing a focal asymmetry is it just a focal asymmetry or is it more than that okay there is also architectural distortion associated with that so how do i know that look at the 2d view and look at the 3d view on the 3d view i'm seeing these peripheral speculations going out from that area of focal asymmetry at 12 o'clock in addition to that are we seeing anything more we are also seeing a central lucency in this and a tiny coarse calcification in that area of focal asymmetry so it's literally like an architectural distortion with a central lucency what am i dealing with okay we also do a focused ultrasound on focused ultrasound i do not see a um, do not see an abnormal mass there i just see what looks like an island of fibroglandular tissue with these lines coming in okay what could this be okay this is typically seen in a radial scar radial scar is an area of architectural distortion with peripheral speculations and central lucency can i just sign it off can i just leave it let it be not really we do biopsy becomes mandatory in cases of even where we suspect a radial scar and how do we do these biopsies typically we do it as stereotactic or tomo guided vacuum assisted biopsy a minimum of 12 samples is obtained and on those 12 samples if it just continues to show radial scar or radial scar with intraductal papilloma we leave it alone surgical excision is not required in the good old days if there was a diagnosis of radial scar with a 14 gauge core biopsy a, a surgical excision biopsy would be recommended because in about 10 to 20% cases they may be associated with low grade dcis or a tubular carcinoma in this case this was in keeping with a pure radial scar with no associated malignancy therefore surgical excision was not performed okay but train your eyes to look at the peripheral speculation okay next case post menopausal 52 year old again comes for a screening mammogram what a beautiful pristine mammogram that's the first impression we have right it looks predominantly fatty some amount of fibroglandular tissue am i seeing any focal asymmetry am i seeing any architectural distortion am i seeing any masses or am i seeing any microcalcification none of the above okay i am happy at my first look of the mlo i'm almost telling myself i'm dealing with a normal case okay till i review the cc views on the cc views do i see anything there is a subtle asymmetry in the lateral aspect of the cc view okay do i see a corroborative asymmetry on the mlo projection not really no matter how much i try to strain my eyes on the 2d view i do not see anything okay but this asymmetry persists now the question is is it a summation artifact or is it something real okay so what do i go to i go to my 3d tomo synthesis now just to just to let you know what are we doing for our patients here like you know in india we don't have a screening program most of the women who come for screening either come on their own or come through their corporations there are nationalized banks who send their employees for annual health checkups there are corporations big corporations who have annual health packages for their employees and there are some self aware women okay who have done enough research on google and internet and or have some family members with breast cancer or some friend who has had a breast cancer who will enroll themselves for screening so those are the kind of patients who come to us often times we don't have the previous for comparison also okay because they go to different different institutions for their mammogram in such situations we have to rely on all the modalities that we have so what do we rely on 3d tomo synthesis when we did 3d tomo synthesis so therefore we also make sure that for all our screening cases we not just do 2d mammogram but 2d with 3d tomo synthesis that was the protocol followed up until now and i will talk about that a little bit more when i talk about sv okay on 3d tomo synthesis what did we see in that area we saw an area of architectural distortion is everyone seeing those lines coming out those peripheral speculations remember what i said in the beginning train your eyes to look for these lines going out from any area anything that looks like a mass or architectural distortion 
Now, this is definitely an area of architectural distortion, right? Is there a central lucency? I'm almost tempted to think, am I dealing with a radial scar here? Okay, I see a central lucency. I see peripheral speculation. So what should we do? Should we leave it alone or should we do a biopsy? Of course, we discussed this. We should do a biopsy. And a biopsy was performed, which was in keeping with an invasive lobular carcinoma. Okay, this is a screen detected, less than two centimeter, no no negative cancer with excellent prognosis. We heard an excellent talk by Dr. Kulkarni on invasive lobular carcinomas. But these are truly, for lack of better word, very sleazy cancers. They know how to hide well. Even in fatty breast, they know how to hide well. Okay, And if we leave them long enough, then they straight show up with metastasis two years or three years or five years later. Leptomeningeal meds, peritoneal meds. So it is end game for the patient. So there is great value in identifying these as early as possible so that the patient can have excellent prognosis, okay? And the other fact that we should know is more than 90% architectural distortions are better seen on 3D tomosynthesis. You won't see them as well on your 2D views, but on 3D tomosynthesis, by virtue of being able to see those peripheral speculations, we are able to see architectural distortions far better. Now, what do we do about cases where we see architectural distortion, but there is no sonographic correlate? Should we leave it alone? Well, not really. The reason being, in these cases, where there is a sonographic correlate, 12% malignancies are detected. But where there is no sonographic correlate identified, even in those cases, there are about 7.7% malignancies detected in cases of architectural distortion. Only TOMO detected architectural distortion. And there is a very nice paper in radiology published in 2018. And this is from, uh, uh, from Jennifer Harvey's group. And the person working on this was Tagri, uh, one, of the, one of the girls from Egypt, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting the last couple of times when I was there. So this is the paper published in radiology by that group. Okay, now what is the next scenario? Now we saw a few cases of screening and what happens with screening. How is it helpful in diagnostic cases? Okay, now here is a case. 48 year old, she's a perimenopausal. She presents with a new onset palpable lump in the right breast. Okay, she's in her 40s. Okay, what is it that we suspect when a patient is in her 40s? Okay, new onset palpable lump. I'm already worried. Okay, but one lesion that is pretty common in the 40s is a phalloides tumor. Could I be dealing with a phalloides tumor? That's one thought that comes to my mind. Okay, so let's look at what the 2D mammogram and 3D tomosynthesis looks like. On the 2D mammogram, we see a relatively circumscribed mass, oval, okay? But it is in the posterior third of the breast. On 3D tomosynthesis, however, so you start seeing the peripheral speculation, like a comet tail sign, okay? Like there is, there is a tail to that. And what is it that these peripheral speculations indicate? The peripheral speculations indicate that there is desmoplastic reaction. Whenever any kind of cancer starts growing in the breast, it causes desmoplastic reaction in the surrounding breast tissue, which gives rise to these speculations, okay? Fibrosis leading to speculations, okay? So this becomes a telltale sign for us. And we saw these peripheral speculations, not along all the margins, but only along the posterior margin. That was, that was good enough for me to be suspicious. On the mammogram, on the ultrasound, what do we see? We saw this relatively oval mass, okay? With posterior through transmission, the margins are not particularly well-defined, but they are not particularly irregular either. In such cases, it becomes very tempting to think whether I'm dealing with a fibroadenoma or am I dealing with something like a phalloides tumor. But remember, we have seen peripheral speculation. And we also know that high-grade invasive cancers can look exactly like benign lesions, like fibroadenomas. Okay? Therefore, when I have to make a tiebreaker, I go back and look at my tomosynthesis images. In this case, we saw those peripheral speculations along the posterior margin, and we went ahead with the biopsy. This was in keeping with a high-grade invasive ductal carcinoma. Okay? A companion case. Mass with partially circumscribed. The mass may be partially circumscribed, but the presence of speculation should raise a level of suspicion. Another case, similar age group. 44-year-old, perimenopausal, presents with a new onset palpable lump in the left breast this time. And she says that she has noticed this lump only for about one to two months. 
Now this breast is as it is a disaster on a 2D mammogram, correct? It is so dense. It is heterogeneously dense. Okay. When we look at the 3D views corresponding on the 2D view, we can barely see the mass. On the 3D view, we start seeing what looks like a relatively circumscribed mass. Okay. Most of the margins I can see and they are circumscribed. Do I see different peripheral speculations? Not really. Okay. So. I also do an ultrasound. On ultrasound, it corresponds to this ovoid, hypoechoic, relatively circumscribed mass, margins look smooth. The patient insists on getting a biopsy done, so we do the biopsy, and it turns out to be a fibroadenoma. Now, let's do a comparison. In this case, notice the absence of peripheral speculations on 3D tomosynthesis. If we look at the two cases, the one which was a fibroadenoma, you look at it on the 2D view, there is absence of peripheral speculation. And the second, which is an invasive duct carcinoma, grade three, look at the presence of peripheral speculations, like a comet tail sign along the posterior margin. Okay, so this is how you make a tiebreaker. Whether you have to biopsy, whether you don't have to biopsy. Okay, should I go ahead with the biopsy? Am I confident I'm dealing with a fibroadenoma? Could it be one of those invasive duct carcinomas, grade three? Okay, so this can be a very good tiebreaker. Key points to remember is. 3D tomosynthesis does superb assessment of lesion margin. Exclusion of superimposed tissue for assessment of smooth margin is indicative of benign lesions and assessment of peripheral speculations raises our suspicion for malignant lesions. Okay. It is invaluable for lesion detection in dense and heterogeneously dense breasts, and it has 25 to 30% better lesion detection rate as compared to 2D in this subset of patients, dense and heterogeneously dense breasts. Next scenario. This is a 46-year-old perimenopausal who had a screening mammogram elsewhere, and she was referred to us for a second opinion. And what was the second opinion sorted for? Whether the microcalcifications in the left breast look suspicious. To the reporting radiologist, they look pleomorphic, and she thought it would be best to biopsy them. So therefore, she had sent it to us for a second opinion. Now, do, do you, are you concerned about those microcalcifications? Or is there anything else that comes to your notice? When we did the 3D tomosynthesis, we looked at the microcalcifications, which did not look, uh, which looked more like a, within a well circumscribed mass. But what caught our attention were these peripheral speculations in another spot, in the upper outer quadrant of the left breast. Okay, so we looked at it again on ultrasound. On ultrasound, what did we find? Corresponding to the microcalcifications, we found this ovoid mass at three o'clock position of the left breast. Okay, there were some coarse calcifications in it. Okay, and smooth margin. This was a calcifying fibroadenoma. However, the area with peripheral speculations corresponded to this irregular hypoechoic solid mass, which was biopsy and was in keeping with invasive duct carcinoma grade two. Okay, so problem solved. Okay, now remember, what is the value of 3D tomosynthesis? Additional lesions that we find by virtue of all these, all these peripheral speculations that we see. Okay, and they have a very high positive predictive value for malignancy. Another case, and this is a bane for all of us. 64-year-old postmenopausal, she has had a right lumpectomy for breast cancer, like a breast conserving surgery with radiation therapy for right breast cancer. She comes for annual screening. Okay. At the time of the annual screening, there is concern about indeterminate microcalcifications at the scar site. They are asking us, should we do a biopsy to rule out recurrence or residual disease? Or is this okay? Can we come to that decision based on 3D tomosynthesis? Let's look. Okay. On 3D tomosynthesis, what do we find? We find that at the scar site, there are these curvilinear calcifications. Okay. And these are very classic. Curvilinear calcifications with central fat are classic of fat necrosis. Fat necrosis at the site of the surgery. So this was problem solving. Problem solved. Patient did not need a biopsy. Okay, and this was in keeping with post-op dystrophic calcification from fat necrosis at the at the scar site. Okay, in this case also 3D tomosynthesis is invaluable. Next case. This is a postmenopausal. Screening mammogram was performed. Predominantly fatty breast. Now, every once in a while in India, I find that patients come and insist that just do a very nice, good ultrasound. 
for screening okay they do not want to do a mammogram because they perceive that mammogram is painful okay i don't want my breast to be compressed and i don't want to go through that pain therefore just doctor just do one good ultrasound and i'm appalled every single time but now for the last 8 years i have spent enough time talking to my patients talking to my referring physicians and i have developed this art of speaking okay i tell them that my technologists are very well trained your breast will not be compressed for a very long time gentle compression for 7 seconds on each side and i assure you you won't feel any pain when you come back to me in this room you'll be a happy camper and these are like autopilot like you know how those uh, pilots in the aircraft or air hostesses in the aircraft have set lines said it's the same way i have these set lines that i say to my patients but it always works trust me okay now here is a case this was a, what looked like a focal asymmetry on the mammogram and what did we see on 3d tomosynthesis there were peripheral speculation okay now why am i showing this case for a very good reason when we did an ultrasound we looked and we looked and we looked but we had a very hard time looking for this lesion why because this was very very isoechoic okay had i not had this mammogram and 3d tomosynthesis i would have easily run over this and this was the same patient who was insisting that she would like a breast ultrasound for screening not a mammogram imagine she would have had the screening ultrasound she would have gone home happily thinking she has no problem and one year or two years later she would have come with a 2 cm uh, mass with some metastatic lymph node okay that's the value of having your mammogram with 3d tomosynthesis you know exactly where to look because i knew where i had to look even in this fatty breast predominantly fatty breast and isoechoic lesion i was able to find this lesion and what is the size of this lesion 8 mm that was the maximum dimension of this lesion okay we finally did a ultrasound core biopsy and this was in keeping with a invasive duct carcinoma the point the key point is small isoechoic lesions in fatty breast can be harder to identify with ultrasound alone without a 2d or 3d correlate therefore have that mammogram do the talking insist on it okay scenario 5 now these are two important cases that i want to show you 63 year old post menopausal left breast patient had spontaneous bloody left nipple discharge are we seeing any abnormality yes of course we are seeing a global asymmetry global asymmetry in the left breast now what am i showing you here the first image the image on the left is a 2d mammogram the image on the right is a s view s view is a synthesized view whereby we obtain 3d tomosynthesis we obtain the stack image and we reconstruct the 2d view okay is it good enough like and this is a 3d view in the pertinent area we are seeing like a ductal pattern there with intraductal growth okay and what are we concerned about we are concerned that we would be dealing with either dcis ductal carcinoma in situ or at best at least intraductal papillomatosis okay we also do an ultrasound now the reason i'm showing the s view is because radiation dose for a 3d acquisition along with 2d view is about 1 to 1.5 times the standard 2d dose so this becomes an area of contention for, for uh, like you know all the time the gyne gynecologists or the surgeons or uh family doctors or for that matter even patients will come and discuss this with you because they have done some kind of google search and they are afraid of radiation okay so in those cases our question is can a s view replace a 2d view okay and these are the images that i have in front of you the first is the actual 2d view the second is the s view the reconstructed view from or a synthesized view and the third is a, is the 3d view we are getting there we are getting there we are in the process of transition i would say like whereby we are seeing enough cases on s view where where uh, we are confident that we are able to see the lesion okay the good point is those from a 3d view with s view which is a synthesized view remains equivalent to that obtained from a standard 2d full field digital mammography having said that have i let go of my 2d view not yet is the answer i'll need some more cases some more experience before i do that but there is enough evidence in literature out there where they are claiming that synthesized views are equivalent to 2d views okay in this case all these dilated ducts with intraductal masses was in keeping with dcis ductal carcinoma in situ in another case diagnostic case 45 year old premenopausal in the right breast there is new onset palpable lump okay 
Now we are seeing the 2D mammogram. We are seeing this area, what looks like a, it's a focal asymmetry or a mass at about 12 o'clock position of the right breast. Okay, and this is the S view. Am I able to see it? Yes, I'm. I'm able to see it. I still continue to see it, and I also and I also see some micro calcifications in that spot. Okay, when I look at the 3D, I'm clearly able to see the margins of this mass. I'm also able to see the peripheral speculations. And I'm able to see the pleomorphic microcalcifications. Okay, very, very clear. You're seeing the difference 2D versus 3D. Is it adding value? It is adding value in big ways to my, uh, to my workup. Okay, so we go ahead and look at all three views here: 2D view, the S view, and the 3D tomosynthesis. The point I'm trying to make here again is even in palpable lumps, we are eventually getting there, where S view might prove very, very useful and we might be eventually able to replace the 2D with the S view. So the key point is, we have to be cognizant of the fact about radiation, and therefore we are working towards getting the synthesized view better. Okay, in this case, this corresponded to what looked like an oval mass, and this was in keeping with invasive duct carcinoma grade three, quite similar to the previous cases that I showed you. Okay, however, remember, peripheral speculations are your friend. When you see them on 3D tomosynthesis, be very, very concerned that you might be dealing with something sinister. Now, almost getting there. Second last case. 44 year old, premenopausal, spontaneous bloody left nipple discharge. Now there is no problem here. This is a predominantly fatty breast. It is not dense. It is not heterogeneously dense. Am I seeing any problem here? Well, not really. Despite the fatty breast, I can't see anything there. On 3D tomosynthesis, do I see anything? Even on 3D tomosynthesis, I don't see anything. On ultrasound, do I see any abnormality? Even on ultrasound, I do not see any abnormality. But the patient insists that this nipple discharge is new onset. She's not expressed. It is spontaneous. Therefore, something needs to be done about it. What do we do? We do contrast enhanced MRI. On contrast enhanced MRI, we see linear non-mass enhancement in the left retroareolar region. Biopsy is performed. And this was in keeping with introductal papillomatosis with DCIS. The point I'm trying to make is 2D mammogram and 3D tomosynthesis as well as ultrasound are structural imaging, anatomic imaging, whereas a contrast enhanced MRI is functional imaging. It relies on the fact that there is new angiogenesis in the region of tumor, any kind of tumor formation, whether it is introductal tumor or it is an invasive cancer. There is new angiogenesis, okay? So structural or anatomic in imaging versus functional imaging, which is contrast-enhanced MRI or contrast-enhanced mammography. So that will definitely add value, which means that there will be, despite the fact that our sensitivity is increasing with 3D tomosynthesis, it is still not the perfect tool. There will be false negative results. Be cognizant of that fact, okay? And remember, if you need additional evaluation in the form of functional imaging, contrast-enhanced MRI or contrast-enhanced mammography, don't shy away from it, okay? And last case, okay, going back to basics. 60-year-old postmenopausal, she says that she feels a new onset palpable lump in the left breast since one to two months. She's never felt it before, okay? The mammogram looks predominantly fatty. My technologist, she tells me that, doctor, every time I try to position the patient, it is really hard because she has very big breasts. She has very uh, voluminous breasts. And she's having a hard time stay, staying steady. She keeps moving or she pulls herself out. Okay. I say, go try again because there is something that concerns me on the original mammogram. I see a little line there, but I'm not sure whether what I'm seeing is real or not real. But my technologist is very good. She goes down, she talks to the patient and she tries again. And when she tries, what does she find? There you go. Are you seeing this man in the inferior hemisphere of the left breast, in the posterior margin? Okay. Remember, no matter how high end your technology gets, you, you can get digital mammography, you can get 3D tomosynthesis, you can get breast MRI, you can get contrast enhanced mammography. But if you don't stick to your basics, quality assurance and positioning, you're going to miss cancers. Okay. This cancer was located very posteriorly and in along the inferior margin. So if my technologist hadn't tried hard enough and positioned properly, this cancer wouldn't have been seen. And it wasn't a small cancer, mind you. It was almost a four centimeter invasive ductal carcinoma. 
So imagine, based on the original mammogram, if we would have just said that this is a negative mammogram, how bad it would have been, right? Therefore, the take-home message from this uh, this uh, this case is, like, with all the high-end technologies, don't forget your basics. Okay. In summary, 3D tomosynthesis is an excellent tool in screening as well as diagnostic cases. It overcomes the problem of superimposition of breast tissue, and it also helps with margin analysis. Okay. Now we have to remember that if we see architectural distortions only on 3D, nothing on 2D, no correlate on ultrasound, even then we have to be very, very concerned and we have to remember to biopsy it simply because in about 7% of the cases, they will be malignant. What about radiation dose? SVU has the potential to replace 2D in, in time, okay? As the more our SVU gets uh, um, uh, like fine-tuned, we will be able to do it. And be cognizant of the fact that this is still structural imaging, okay? So there will be false negatives every now and again, okay? And that will require help of functional imaging in the form of contrast-enhanced mammography or contrast-enhanced MRI. And um, with that, I would like to say thank you for uh, your attention. And remember, continuous effort, not strength, not intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. So keep trying. Keep trying to get better with yourself, acquiring more knowledge and getting better, and keep trying with technology also. The better technology comes, try to incorporate it into your practice, because at the end of the day, who benefits from it? Our patients, our women, okay? So with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention, and um, uh, should we take questions or should we go to the next talk? Would you introduce your next session, Dr. Dr. Rawi? Okay. Dr. Rawi, you may introduce our next session and unmute yourself first. Would you unmute yourself, Dr. Rawi? We still can't hear you. Your microphone, turn on your microphone. You can unmute your email from your site. You, now, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, uh, lecture will be presented by Dr. Shilba also. She is going to present for us a film reading session. Okay. Dr. Shilba, please. Yes, 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 right. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So okay. Uh, this this is a film reading session, which means I got the liberty to uh, make a potpourri of cases, all sorts of different cases put together, which were kind of a diagnostic challenge, or they had a good teaching point, and therefore I have put these cases together. Okay. So here we go. Now the objective of this talk, like. At the end of the day, when we are in our regular session, we are at work, we are seeing all these patients, a mixed bag of screening versus diagnostic. Our aim is to tell whether there is a cancer or no cancer, how to problem solve when ultrasound features are equivocal or when mammogram is equivocal, what do you do next? To understand the importance of performing a diagnostic mammogram, to identify ultrasound features of masses that warrant biopsy, to understand the importance of correlating with ultrasound after performing MRI also, and to know how to problem solve when mammogram and ultrasound are equivocal. So those are some of the objectives we have kept in mind and put these cases together. So here is our first case. This is a 45 year old, pre-menopausal. She comes for a screening mammogram. On the screening mammogram, what do I see? What do you see? My attention goes to this area of focal asymmetry. Okay, I see this focal asymmetry and I start getting very, very concerned that I'm dealing with a cancer. Okay, no matter how many times I put my ultrasound probe on it, I only see normal breast tissue in this area. And I cannot understand for the love of God, like why am I seeing normal breast tissue? Why am I not seeing a real lesion? This seems like a big enough area. Okay, so what do I do? Remember, we have 3D tomosynthesis. So I go back to my 
3D tomosynthesis. And what do I see? Surrounding this area, there is a nice little capsule. Can everyone appreciate this capsule here? Like surrounding that area, that white capsule. This was in keeping with a benign hamartoma. Hamartoma is basically a breast within breast, an encapsulated breast tissue that is seen on mammography. Well circumscribed, mixed density mass, surrounded by a thin capsule. Okay, and it is typically soft and non-palpable. Therefore, the patient did not feel any palpable lump. She has just come for a screening. Okay. In addition, you'll also see fat in it, and you'll also see a radiolucent zone surrounding it. But you know, uh, every once in a while, we have to be cognizant of the fact that such benign lesions exist. Otherwise, it is like um, like um, chasing a mirage. You know, that's what happens. Now, we would have asked for a, a contrast-enhanced MRI. We would have asked for biopsies, tomo-guided biopsies. All sorts of things, okay. But just by virtue of noticing this capsule on 3D tomosynthesis, we realized that we were only dealing with um, a hamartoma. This patient has been on follow-up for two years now, and this has remained stable, okay. Next case. This is a 54-year-old who presented to us with a palpable lump in the medial aspect of the left breast, and she says she has felt it only in the last few months. When we performed the mammogram, we saw. This relatively well circumscribed ovoid mass. She is 54. Okay. On ultrasound, what does it correspond to? It corresponds to this large, almost four centimeter ovoid mass, which has relatively smooth to lobulated margins, but it also has non-uniform cystic spaces. What are we dealing with? We did a biopsy, and this was in keeping with a colloidal tumor. Okay. Now. Like I mentioned before, these are the tumors which typically occur in 40s. These are large oval masses, sometimes with peripheral lobulation, most of the times with non-uniform cystic spaces. But the big question is: Is it a benign phalloides or is it a malignant phalloides? Oftentimes, when we even do a core biopsy, the pathologist is unable to tell us. Okay, and they will say that borderline or low-grade phalloides tumor, surgical excision recommended. Okay. So as recommended, we were definitely planning a surgical excision. But wait, are we done? Have we seen the case properly? Have we evaluated everything? I'll show you the mammogram again. Look at the mammogram a second time. Okay. Sometimes what happens is when the patient comes with a palpable lump or a um, or a diagnostic dilemma in one breast, we oftentimes very quickly look at the contralateral side. The point is to be able to focus on the contralateral side also properly. In this case, we saw this focal asymmetry in the right breast, in the lower inner quadrant. Okay, a correlative ultrasound corresponded to this irregular hypoechoic solid mass with angulations along the margin. Ultrasound biopsy was in keeping with a invasive lobular carcinoma. So the take-home message or the teaching point in a case such as this is. Satisfaction of search should not preclude us, should not stop us from doing optimal evaluation of the rest of the breast as well as the contralateral breast. Okay. Now, going back to a few basics, I'm going to show you three consecutive cases here. First is a 25-year-old who presents with a palpable lump in the upper outer quadrant of the right breast. What is the most probable diagnosis? And there are some uniform cystic spaces. Could it be a fibroadenoma? Could it be a phalloides tumor? Could it be a cancer or could it be a cyst? In this case, this was a fibroadenoma. These are typical oval, oval, oval masses with smooth echogenic margin. They are homogeneously hypoechoic, typically parallel to the pector, pectoral muscle, and they have uniform cystic spaces. Most often, they happen in women under 35 years of age, and most common tumors in this age group. And 50 to 75 percent of the women will have benign fibroadenoma. This is a 40-year-old. New onset palpable lump in the right breast. This time, what is the most probable diagnosis? Fibroadenoma, phalloides tumor, cancer, or a cyst. This time, it was a phalloides tumor. These also can be oval in shape. They can have smooth lobulated margins. They can have non-uniform cystic spaces. They occur typically in the fourth decade. So, new onset palpable lump in the late 30s, early 40s. Be cognizant of the fact that you may be dealing with a high-risk lesion such as phalloides tumor. Which may require surgical excision. Okay. Now this is a 27-year-old lactating. 
woman who presents with this palpable lump. It can't be a fibroadenoma. It can't be a phalloides tumor. Is it a galactosal? That's the first thing that comes to mind. Or is it a cancer? This time it was a cancer. Remember, do proper margin analysis. Although this is an oval mass, there are micro lobulations along the margin. Okay, and in addition to that, there is an enlarged lymph node with loss of fatty hilum. You must do a biopsy for this. How do we recognize? How do we do margin analysis? And uh, you know, when it is a fibroadenoma, the margins are very smooth. When it is a cancer, there are micro lobulations along the margins, like the ridge cookies. But when it is something like a phalloides tumor, you will have gentle lobulations and non-uniform cystic spaces, like animal crackers. Okay. So when you have something to correlate with, something to uh, some analogy to go by, it is easy to put your mind to it. Okay. So when you're doing analysis of lesions on ultrasound, these are some of the things you look for: angulations along the margins. You look for micro calcifications within the mass. You look for speculations, like we like we spoke about on tomosynthesis, uh, like architectural distortion. These are some of the typical signs of cancer that we see. On the other hand, if this was a galactosal, how would it be different? In galactosals, they can be complex solid cystic masses. They can be ovoid, or they can be rounded. But if you do a limited mammogram, many a times you will see this fat fluid level. What is recommended? You can do an aspiration that can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Okay. Now next case: thirty-year-old painless palpable lump in the left breast. Okay. Now we saw so many cases, right? Early, early age, twenty-five-year-old, forty-year-old, uh, lactating woman. This is a thirty-year-old painless palpable lump in the left breast. Okay. She is confident. She hundred percent tells us. that this is only a painless palpable lump and this is new i have never felt this before i try to ask is it more prominent in the week before the period does it get less after the period she says no doctor it has been persistently present for the last 2 to 3 months when i do an ultrasound this is all i see what looks like ecogenic breast tissue okay i am like i'm thinking whether this is normal breast tissue but i can actually feel my probe go over it like a mass okay could it be a fibroadenoma could it be a cancer okay can i perform a mammogram for correlation the patient is only 30 yes the answer to that question is yes you can perform that one diagnostic mammogram that is not going to kill your patient that radiation is not harmful for your patient okay one diagnostic mammogram and i'll tell you a little bit more about radiation in a little bit but look at the mammogram on the mammogram this is what we saw yes definitely the mammogram is dense but do you see these micro calcifications these are pleomorphic micro calcifications in a regional distribution no matter how high end my transducer is ultrasound transducer i will not be able to see this with ultrasound this can be seen only with a mammogram okay and therefore it becomes an, a very effective problem solving tool or uh, you know uh, to uh, to resolve your diagnostic dilemma this is definitely not normal breast tissue or fibroadenoma this was pleomorphic microcalcifications in a regional distribution and this was in keeping with high grade dcis okay so what's up with the radiation why do they keep talking repeatedly about radiation so let's understand how much radiation does a woman receive with a single mammogram with a single mammogram patient receives 0.0004 gray of radiation a fatal dose of radiation is more than 5 grays so to reach that fatal dose a woman would need 12500 mammograms can you imagine during her entire lifetime she is not going to have those 12500 mammograms and for some context in hiroshima when that bombing was done 9.4 grays of radiation was released from the natural surrounding alone in less than like you know year every single one of us receives about 0.003 grays of radiation and one mammogram is equal to natural radiation of 7 weeks literally speaking okay so don't be afraid of doing that single mammogram if you need to here's another case 32 year old presents with painless palpable lump in the right breast the ultrasound was normal so we decided to do a mammogram mammogram was not helpful because it was heterogeneously dense okay so we decided to do a mri on mri what do we see we see this big huge area of non mass enhancement involving the entire upper outer quadrant of the right breast okay this was biopsied and it was in keeping with high grade dci patient underwent skin and nipple sparing right mastectomy and prophylactic left mastectomy with reconstruction and we heard a beautiful talk by dr supriya kulkarni on this like a, a skin and nipple sparing mastectomy follow up 
there is no clear consensus about how to follow up especially if the patient is not high risk okay in in this situation the patient was not high risk okay she was the only sole person in her family who had developed breast cancer so when she came for a follow up um it was very uh, it was a lot of controversy about how the follow up should be done she went to her doctor and she says that i feel some palpable nodularity on the reconstructed side on the right okay now the doctor was also confused whether it is just post operative changes or is this a new finding we didn't know anyway because there is technically no breast tissue the decision was let's do a problem solving mri when a mri was done what happened one year later look at this on the mri it is a skin and nipple sparing mastectomy remember the implant has been put behind the pectoral muscle there is very little tissue left between the skin and the and the uh, and the mastectomy site okay but that little tissue is also enough okay and this patient one year later had this asymmetric non mass enhancement in a linear distribution now how do we prove this is a cancer this was a very challenging case okay linear non mass enhancement anterior to the implant we did a mammogram on the mammogram did we see microcalcification yes we saw microcalcification and under ultrasound guidance we did ultrasound biopsy of those microcalcifications and this proved that there was recurrence the point i'm trying to make is don't be afraid of doing that mammogram as long as you know whether there is a implant in place no implant in place whether your patient is young or old don't be afraid of doing that one mammogram for problem solving is the point okay so in women below 40 years of age thorough assessment of morphologic features shape, ultrasound shape margin ecogenicity very important if suspicious findings are seen on ultrasound or indeterminate findings on ultrasound don't af be afraid of proceeding to a mammogram do that mammogram if indeterminate or suspicious findings are seen on mammogram and ultrasound go ahead with your biopsy if you there is a clinical suspicion and mammogram is occult or ultrasound you can't find then problem solving with mri becomes essential okay now here is a case to prove that point this was a 52 year old post menopausal she complained of painless palpable lump in the right breast she presented in january and what is the most probable diagnosis this is what they saw they called it a cyst this was called a cyst because it's a relatively well circumscribed mass it looks anechoic there is posterior through transmission okay but remember cysts do not occur in post menopausal women and you won't get one single cyst in a post menopausal woman cysts are usually ovoid or round smooth margin posterior through transmission all those factors are there but one thing that does not fit into all of this is the fact that the patient is post menopausal and she has one single cyst how does that happen nonetheless the patient was sent back she came back 6 months later now she has increasing palpable lump nipple inversion and skin thickening okay and on ultrasound we see this shadowing mass on mri the whole breast is enhancing okay this was a locally bre advanced breast cancer now delayed diagnosis leading to a locally advanced breast cancer so the point we are trying to make is not every patient needs a breast mri for problem solving but where it is required don't be afraid of asking for that breast mri for problem solving especially when there is a high level of suspicion new onset palpable lump post menopausal women what you see looks like a cyst in a single cyst nothing matches up here so in these situations if there is a problem please ask for a problem solving mri okay then here is another case 48 year old presents with crusting and scaling of the left nipple since 2 to 3 months what are we dealing with is it psoriasis is it dried nipple secretions is it paget's disease of the nipple or do we need a mammogram for correlation okay before anything else we decided to do a mammogram for correlation on the mammogram are we seeing anything it looks like a predominantly fatty breast but i will show you something here when we did spot magnification views of the area of concern we started seeing all these pleomorphic microcalcifications in a regional distribution all over the place and the mri corresponded to this asymmetric non mass enhancement involving the lower outer quadrant of the left breast biopsy was in keeping with dcis and invasive cancer and notice the nipple areolar complex there is marked skin thickening and enhancement of the nipple areolar complex skin punch biopsy of that area was in keeping with paget's disease of the nipple paget's disease of the nipple presents as ulceration of the nipple associated with underlying malignancies in up to 50% cases 
Diagnosis is done by skin sponge biopsy of the nipple areolar complex. But remember, mammogram is very, very important because in more than 50% of the cases, there will be associated DCIs. But if the mammogram and ultrasound are uh, occult, then MRI will help as a problem solving tool. And don't go by the density. Sometimes the density can be uh, a little bit perplexing. Like, you know, you feel that everything looks normal. Here's a case, 46 year old presents with a painless palpable lump in the right breast since one month. She also has a strong family history of breast cancer. It looks like scattered fibroglandular densities. Again, I don't see any masses, microcalcifications, architectural distortions. But corresponding to the area of palpable concern, ultrasound demonstrates this diffuse shadowing. What should I do? Should I ask for a six month follow up? Or should I do additional evaluation? Because the patient also has a strong family history of breast cancer and we can feel this palpable lump, we do MRI for problem solving. And on MRI, there is asymmetric non-mass enhancement involving the entire superior hemisphere of the right breast. Even when I look at it in retrospect on the mammogram, I'm unable to see this, okay? So this is exactly what we're trying to say, structural imaging versus functional imaging. And this was in keeping with invasive lobular carcinoma. And this is what invasive lobular carcinomas do. They grow along the Cooper's ligament and therefore there is very little desmoplastic reaction. And therefore we don't see those classic speculated masses that we are used to seeing. Oftentimes there will be no microcalcifications associated with it. Okay, therefore you have to be cognizant of the fact. And no matter, um, no matter how many invasive lobular carcinomas you see, you see it only occasionally because they account for 10 to 15% of all invasive cancers. So every time in your, uh, in your regular clinic or regular um, diagnostic setup, when you see a case of invasive lobular cancer, it will always make you rack your brain, okay? Because everything almost seems normal, but there is something going on there, okay? Now, multimodality approach is the key for timely diagnosis. And here are a few cases. And these are very, very close to my heart because these cases involve Egypt, okay? Here is a 44-year-old female. She presents with a new onset palpable lump in the left axilla since two months. 2D mammogram, we see an enlarged left axillary lymph node. But on the rest of the mammogram, we don't see any abnormality. How do we deal with this? We do a contrast enhanced mammography. On contrast enhanced mammography, what do we see? We start seeing an enhancing mass, okay? And on the subtracted images also, that enhancing mass persists, that, uh, that subtle, subtle enhancement is there. So we go back and do an ultrasound. On ultrasound, we see that what looks like an enlarged abnormal lymph node and corresponding to that uh, enhancing mass that we saw on contrast enhanced mammography, ultrasound corresponded to a 1.5 centimeter irregular hypoechoic mass. Biopsy was performed and it was in keeping with a palpable, that palpable abnormality was in keeping with a metastatic axillary lymph node. And the non-palpable abnormality was invasive duct carcinoma, which was triple negative, and it was identified on contrast enhanced mammography. This was the very first case of contrast enhanced mammography that I did. However, when I reached out to my dear friend, Rasha Kamal, she told me that Shilpa, a contrast enhanced mammogram is supposed to look like this, okay? When you do contrast enhanced mammography, and when you obtain subtracted images, if there is a cancer, it should light up like a light bulb. Well, my case did not light up like a light bulb for sure. This is my subtracted CDM versus this is the subtracted CDM from, uh, from Cairo University, okay? I could not understand what I had done wrong, whether my injection rate was wrong or whether my uh, software was wrong, I could not understand anything, okay? So I had only one question to my vendor, which is Fujifilm. And I asked them, how can we bring the level of contrast on the subtracted images to the same level as that on the Cairo images, okay? So then started collaborative work. Fujifilm India, Fujifilm Egypt, University of Cairo, NM Medical Mumbai, everyone started working together. And this was in October, 2020, okay? And what was the result of that, okay? Here's another case. Of, uh, almost a month later, we had this 42 year old who came for a screening mammogram do you see any abnormality on the screening mammogram? At first sight, this looks abnormal. This looks like an asymmetry in the inferior hemisphere of the left breast, okay? But was that abnormal? Well, no. We did a few things in between, but I will show you what happened when we did contrast enhanced mammography. And this was after working with University of Cairo, and this is what we saw. Voila, now it lights up like a light bulb, right? 
in the upper outer quadrant of the right breast we see this area of asymmetric non mass enhancement and it lights up like a light bulb okay the left breast lesion turned out to be a fibroadenoma and the right breast enhancement turned out to be non calcified dcis remember this is functional imaging just like contrast enhanced mri contrast enhanced mammography is functional imaging therefore where there is new angiogenesis we will see excellent enhancement enhancement like light bulb okay when we compared it to contrast enhanced mri it almost looked equivocal on contrast enhanced mri we saw the same literally the same extent of disease that we saw on the contrast enhanced mammography okay we are only like 4 months old in contrast enhanced mammography but the results in the first few months look very promising okay but to reach here we received a lot of help from our dear friends in egypt my first case which was done on august 29 of subtracted cdm look like this and my most recent case which was done on november 23rd look like this but for reference and for help i had images from university of cairo i had images i had help from everyone at university of cairo okay the power of collaboration and working together and for this i have to thank dr asha kamal doc uh, dr dina hamdi who who made all this happen they actually worked together with our team india so that the software could be upgraded the software and the algorithm could be brought to this level and i have to thank merit for making this bridge of friendship between india and egypt and making things happen because at the end of the day when we work together who benefits our patients okay all the women out there all the women of the world they are the ones who benefit so the teaching points from everything that we do all the work that we do mammogram and ultrasound remember it is structural imaging you will get a lot of information from it but there is some amount of information we won't get from it contrast enhanced mri and contrast enhanced mammography it is morphological and functional imaging and it adds value to it with mri we also have the advantage of multiplanar imaging plus going back right up to the axilla like uh, supriya said in her talk like axillary lymph nodes and all those things are very well seen on mri so i don't see mri being completely replaced by contrast enhanced mammography but contrast enhanced mammography will be invaluable as a problem solving tool is what i i feel from my my own uh, few months of experience functional imaging is a reliable problem solving tool for excluding malignancy uh, which can't be confirmed just based on conventional imaging and uh, the most important lesson i have learned through the years is working together towards the goal of breast health for the women of the world and with this i would like to thank all my friends in egypt for having me uh, come for this conference for the third year consecutively and i am uh, very very grateful to merit for introducing me to a whole bunch of friends in egypt i'm very grateful to rasha for trusting me with this talk and um, to dr al ghazali who uh, who uh, kind of trusts uh, rasha and merit with uh, all the speakers they get uh dina for making contrast enhanced mammography a reality for us in india and everyone out there in the audience so thank you very much and if there are any questions i would be happy to take them okay uh, thank you dr shelva my pleasure i'm going to escape from the screen here um so that we can take the questions I first want to thank you Shilpa for all these compliments. Sir. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean I I mean it from the bottom of my heart. It thank it, you. Uh, your help has been uh, uh, great and I can do this uh, contrast enhanced mammography only because of all the help that I have received from from you from Dina from uh, Fuji Film Egypt. Yes, thank you. Thank you Shilpa. Uh well are there any uh, questions for me? First, we will uh, move to the next uh, lecture, and then uh, we will uh, have the discussion time. Okay. And now, Dr. Nermin, could you introduce the next speaker in the next lecture? Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Adina, our dear eminent breast radiology in Mansoura University for perfect moderation and kind introduction. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Arasha, Dr. Meret, Dr. Iman Awais, the BGIC committee for inviting me and the great effort that you all do. Now we will go to second speaker, Prof. Dr. Sahar Mansour.
دكتور صحر منصور اوكي okay, از بروفيسور اوف جيولوجي وومن ايميجينج يونت كاسلايني هوسبيتال كايرو يونيفرستي دكتور منصور از ذا هيد اوف ساينتيفيك كوميتي اوف ايجيبشن سوسايتي اوف بريست ايميجينج شي از اولسو مودريتور اند سينيور كونسلتنت از ذا بريزيدنشال كامبين فور سكريننج اوف بريست كانسر ات كاسلايني a hospital, Cairo University. Dr. Mansour is also a consultant of breast imaging at Bahia Foundation for early detection and treatment of breast cancer. Dr. Sahar will talk now uh, about mammogram and artificial intelligence and overview of Qasraini experience. Dr. Sahar. Thank you, Professor Dr. Nermeen. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Well, as uh, Professor Dr. Nermeen said, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and the mammogram, our experience in Australian Hospital. Um, uh, of course, we all agree that mammography is the initial examination for many women with breast symptoms, and it is the cornerstone of the breast cancer screening. And to be more accurate in the cancer detection, we uh, always need another assistance. And in, in most of the cases, it's quite the ultrasound, but recently we use the breast tomo sensors. Recently, we have now the concept of development uh, and implantation of the artificial intelligence for the mammography. Uh, and actually, at the Australiani Hospital for the radiology department, we have the mammograms recaptured with the aid of Lunit Insight for mammography, which is a medical artificial intelligence software company that was FDA approved on November 2019. Um, there was, in 15 years ago, a film uh, called Minority Report that uh, predicted the future about a police officer who could see through monitors future crime. And uh, to have the same uh, impact, AI has a prognosis for the breast cancer, like so it provides location information about detected breast cancers on the mammograms in the form of heat maps, and also shows the abnormality scores that reflect the probability of malignancy in the, the mammogram images. So uh, the first question that pops up in our mind that either AI is for detection of the breast cancer only as it's commercially used or we could use it for diagnosis as well and discrimination between benign and breast uh, cancers uh, in the breast. So through our observation in the, uh, uh, for, through the AI observation in our department, we could find that there is what's called the AI interpretation that works by two arms. The first one is the qualitative concept about data visualization that shows the magnitude of abnormality as color hue with it ranges from a very light blue color to the intense red. And on the other side, we have the quantitative numerical estimate of the degree of confidence for the suspicion of malignancy that ranges between uh, less than 10% to 100% for the abnormality scoring and confidence on, that we are dealing with malignancy. For example, we have this case, uh, um, it came for screening mammogram. Actually, the breast is so much busy full of glandular tissue. It's very difficult to find if there is illusional lesions or, or we are dealing with ongoing cancer, actually. And it may take from 30 to even 45 minutes uh, to establish the pathology by an expert radiologist. Yet on going through the AI, it's obvious that in one second from scanning, the abnormality is high up there in the left breast upper outer quadrant with intense red hue and a confidence of abnormality scoring according to the artificial intelligence of about 99% that we're dealing with a left breast cancer. We use breast tomosensis for more confirmation to check the information given by the AI, and yet we have this mass here. It's speculated, it's very much obvious that it's malignant, yet it's much smaller than that uh, recorded by the AI. And going up there in the tomo images, yes, there is here another lesion. It's partially obscured and partially having a circumscribed border. It's actually a malignant intramammary node. And so the AI not only detected the cancer, it actually scans the full extent of the disease. And it's very good privilege provided by the AI as well. Another case, this time it came for a diagnostic mammogram. It's very obvious that we have a mass here at the axillary tail of the right breast. I'm going through both breasts, um, although it's predominantly fatty, yet there is no so much uh, thing that's obvious in both breasts. However, here in the deep central portion, there is this cluster of microcalcification. 
went to the ultrasound, the axillary mass, it gives a confident appearance of a malignant lymph node by its vascularity and the globular appearance. Scanning the whole right breast, there is nothing there. Even the cluster of microcalcification is not that obvious. It is it is nerve from the surrounding glandular tissue. However, the combined evaluation of both the mammogram and the ultrasound gives the breast the category of virats for suspicion. At the level of AI, there is additional lesion there in the retro error region detected by the eye with intense, rather intense view. Going through the Thomas sensors, yes, this lesion is here. It's a spider-shaped architecture distortion in the, the retro error region that was missed by the mammogram and even by the ultrasound. The uh, Thomas sensors detected also the cluster of the calcification and the axillary mass, it's what obvious here. So the AI give us information comparable to the Thomas sensors and according to this case, we may have escaped the X-ray radiation by the digital uh, breast Thomas sensors and he had the prognosis of the mass breast cancer by the conventional imaging. Another case here having an area of ill definition in the deep center portion of the right breast, lower quadrant. And by the ultrasound, we are more evident that the lesion is much suspicion with ill-defined outline. And even the axillary node showed the somatical cortical thickening with muffled fatty hilum. Again, the combined evaluation of both modalities give us the suspicion of virat spore category. The eye at this level shows no prognosis of the mass. It's even of a very, very faint hue and the confidence of suspicion of malignancy, it's only 24% is very low. And at this point, we are not confident about the AI. How this suspicious mass on by the conventional imaging that was obvious this time on the ultrasound and the AI neglected them and give it this much low scoring. Uh, but on going to the biopsy, it was the benign non-specific granulomatous mastitis. And so the AI was sure about the nature of the disease, although it gives us a very uh, suspicious impression on the digital mammogram together with the ultrasound. Another example, this case having two lesions, one of them is speculated, uh, and there is another one that's in the deep central portion, which overlied by glandular tissue partially. On the ultrasound, the deep central lesion, um, it's very obvious on this ultrasound, it's of circumscribed pattern, it's uh, presumably adenoma. And regarding the other one, which is malignant looking on the ultrasound, which are more confident that we are dealing with malignant mass with invasive appearance, it's, uh, which uh, appreciate the speculated portion of the margin of the mass. Going to the contrast enhanced mammogram, the presumed adenoma showed the homogeneous enhancement is comparable to the nodular background of the breast and the suspicious mass high up there in the upper outer quadrant of the right breast. On the contrast enhanced mammogram, it confirms more the suspicion of malignancy by its speculations, heterogeneous pattern, and intense contrast uptake, which is more than the glandular tissue. Going to the AI, the suspicion of malignancy was only 33%. And again, we have this dilemma and we proceed to the biopsy. And surprisingly, it's this time again, it's nodular sclerosis, it's a benign condition. Again, AI, in spite of the morphology looking of being a malignant mass, give us a normality scoring that is more near to the actual pathology of the disease. Another case here, the malignancy is obvious in the upper outer quadrant of the right breast. Yet we have here in the retro error region an area of asymmetrical density, which is not there on the right, left breast. And also we, there is associate skin thickening that require further evaluation. Scanning by the AI, it only tells us that we, there is only a malignancy in the upper outer quadrant with a confidence scoring of 99% and very intense red hue. Going to the contrast enhanced mammogram, it confirms the information presented by the artificial intelligence. There is no dermal thickening, there is no nothing there in the retro error region, only a unifocal upper outer quadrant mass. And so in this case also, the AI gave us the proper confidence about the malignancy of the disease and even excludes that we are dealing with extra invasion within the breast. This case also could have escaped the extra radiation from the contrast enhanced mammogram and even the injection of the contrast. So I guess AI, the modality of the year, it does give us information comparable to other modalities like Thomas Census, contrast enhanced mammogram, 
at uh, both the setting of screening and diagnosis. It does the work of hundreds of clinicians and could make breast biopsies unnecessary. Well, going again to this case, we could find that the contrast enhanced mammogram have shown us that there is a mass here in the retroarial region. And in the mammogram and the scanned image with the AI, there, the mass was not there. And so we guess at this point, we may say that the AI missed a lesion. Well, actually, it doesn't miss this lesion. It ignores the lesion. It neglected the lesion because the AI scores the suspicion of malignancy and according to the parameters of the AI algorithm, this mass is not suspicious, and so it doesn't give us an, a color here. Again, to our question, AI is for detection or for diagnosis, and I may say that AI, yes, for detection, diagnosis, but only for cancers, not for the benign lesions. To go with our um, uh, theories, of, uh, this are these two cases, case number one and case number two, they show a uh, comparable intensity of the hue according to the AI, and even the scoring is larger of equal percentage. To discuss case one on the ultrasound, the mass is seen here that involving the entire uh, left breast, uh, it was irregular with complex features. That's a little bit suspicious on the uh, ultrasound, and also its picture on the mammogram, also it's suspicious. On the contrast enhanced mammogram, even the area in between the masses showing abnormal contrast uptake and very, very um, uh, suspicious and fishy. By the pathology, it was mucinous breast carcinoma. The other case, which shown the same comparable hue and percentage on the AI, we found that there are multiple cells, some of them complicated. On the Thomas census, the cells are very obvious, it's clustered and clumped altogether. However, we have this area here with the ill definition. And so we biopsied this area specifically, and we find that it is epithelial tissue and just fiber denoted there is no evidence of malignancy. And so why AI have performed such overlap? We can find that the case number one is a mucinous carcinoma, it was malignant, and case number two, it's a fibrocystic disease, and the eye could not actually discriminate between two of them. He put them, both of them, at the same category. Well, AI uh, algorithm doesn't know that there are some cancers that is of soft consistency, and the way of invasion is in the same plane of the breast tissue. And so according to the AI, he did not give it that much um, evidence and uh, percentage scoring of being malignant. On the other side, he doesn't know that there is a fibrocystic disease. It's a chronic condition that every now and then affect the patient with epitheliosis and fibrosis and inflammations of the breast that may give a scarring and distortion, and although it's a benign condition. So uh, sometimes we have this overlap. And again, we are going to say that AI cannot discriminate. It only scores the abnormalities. Well, as I said, so this is unfair to estimate the AI for actually regarding the malignant looking masses on the mammogram, if the AI score it for, for a percentage of more than or equals to 80%, it's actually definitely malignant. And uh, if we have a suspicious lesions on the mammogram and the AI score it for a low scoring of less than or equals to 40%, yes, I'm confident about him and it's actually benign. And according to the scanning that we performed at the radiology department, Cairo University, for 1,200 mammograms, you, we could find there is a cutoff value of 57% that could uh, uh, get us where to go about the nature of the disease, in spite of being malignant looking on the mammogram. This makes us very, very uh, enthusiastic about the use of AI in other uh, applications rather than only the detection and diagnosis. We may use it for the local staging of the pathologically proven breast cancer. Uh, for example, this case, the malignancy is so much obvious over the fatty background. It's reflected there in the uh, lower inner quadrant of the right breast. The AI see the mass and give us abnormality scoring of 99% confidence. On going to the contrast enhanced mammogram, there are three lesions high up there in the upper outer quadrant. And so according to our parameters, it's a multicentric carcinoma. We may say that uh, the AI have missed these satellites and minions. When going to the mammogram again, we can see these baby cancers very obvious, uh, uh, guided by the contrast enhanced mammogram. But to be fair, again, I guess that AI have neglected these lesions and we don't know up till the moment that why sometimes the eye neglects these small lesions in the presence of an index 
cancer in the same breast. Another case having this large mass in the uh, axillary tail of the blessed breast, the eye only see the mass, it's according to the eye, it's a unifocal carcinoma. In the contrast enhanced mammogram, there are another two baby cancer here nearby, and so it's a multifocal carcinoma. Going to the ultrasound, we could detect them, but the AI doesn't see them or, in another words, skip them. We are going on, there is going on research in our department to see why sometimes the eye neglect these baby cancers, because according to our experience, the eye can detect small lesions, even up to 0.5 centimeter cancers. Um, I'm a bit sure that he didn't um, uh, miss it. Actually, there's something there in the AI algorithm that make it neglect this lesion in the presence of a large um, index mass. Another promising application is the use of AI in the follow-up uh, in the post-treated breast cancer. And first we'll go with the post-chemotherapy. This case is a case of locally advanced breast cancer that fulfilled all her chemotherapy cycles. And here there is a clip within the lesion after the end of the session. Sometimes it's very difficult to get the whole extent of the residual disease after the chemotherapy. And in most of the cases we either use MRI and recently we use a contrast enhanced mammogram where we it's um, an invasive um, modality of some sort and also we inject contrast material. Going through the AI, you could find that the hue presented there have actually established the extent of the residual disease uh, with um, abnormality scoring it's low 27%. And so we may presume that we could use the AI not actually to detect the extent of the disease post therapy. We may even use it to follow up the patient if even it's responsive to treatment or, or not by uh, con monitoring the percentage decrease with the uh, different cycles all through the treatment. Another post-treated breast is the post-operative breast. Uh, the case number one, uh, it shows post-operative changes uh, of dermal thickening. However, the scar more or less is fine. And according to the eye, there is low probability that we are dealing with recurrence or dealing with malignancy. Yet case number two, here the eye presumed that we have at the operative bed the recurrent carcinoma with the intense hue and abnormality scoring of 95%. Yet going through the tomosensors, we can find the circumscribed portion of the lesion and even the blue senses of the fat. It's a typical fat necrosis and seroma at the operative bed is one of the common complication post-operative. At the right side, when there is no complication within the breast, the AI give us the proper scoring and proper view. While when there is benign complication, it was there is overlap because the AI doesn't know that the, the lesion, the, this case is post-operative and the lesion out there is due to the distortion of the operation and the uh, common complication to present. Uh, also, we have ongoing research at the, our department to state the use of AI uh, in the post-operative stages. Another movie called Jerry Maguire in the movie the, uh, that it's about a sport agent that promote athletes and during the movie the uh, client always said to uh, him, uh, show me the money, make me rich, make me famous, I want to get the most profit ever from my capabilities and the uh, super uh, the super agent, the sport agent tell him help me, help you, help me, help you and actually this is, should be our relation with the artificial intelligence. We should monitor its performance all the time and in order to get um, the proper uh, uh, if, uh, performance from the AI and do continuous monitoring to get what's called the AR, which describe the combination between the human and AI hybrid doctor. So if you have an AI uh, uh, in the... Uh, AI software in your department and want to know where to go and what to do, what is how to navigate through the cases by using the AI algorithm. Well, first we should focus about the breast density, uh, the different types of breast densities. And if we have an SCR A or B and the AI said, no, there is no uh, uh, lesions there out in the mammogram, we'll actually be confident about what he says to you and no further workup is needed in the setting of the screening. If we have the SCR, C, or D, and the AI said no, uh, please go to ultrasound first. If it is normal, okay, there is no further workup. And if we find a benign mass, we will ask the patient to do the follow-up accordingly, either to six months or annual follow-up. 
uh, irrespective of the uh, density of the breast. And the AI said we are dealing with the lesion. We'll go to the ultrasound for more characterization and discrimination confidence. If the lesion is benign, we'll go for the follow-up. And if the lesion is malignant looking and the AI give us an AI scoring of equals to or less than 57%. So uh, this time we'll go for biopsy uh, in order to exclude the potential malignancy and we'll comfort the patient about the pathology of the disease. Although it's malignant looking yet, AI tells us that it's most likely it's of a benign nature. And if uh, the AI is covering with more than or equals to 57%, well, this time the biopsy will go to biopsy for, to confirm the malignancy. And we will do contrast enhanced studies to uh, do precise staging and evaluation of the extent of the disease uh, regarding multicentricity and multifocality. So whenever I find this scanning with the AI, I will say that it is a scan case for artificial intelligence that showed right breast, upper outer quadrant, breast lesion abnormality scoring, suspicion of malignancy, and it re requires further evaluation by the radiologist. Before I go, I would like to thank Fujifilm company, especially Ahmed Maray, sales and marketing manager, AI informatics and medical IT together with Christiana Honnold, the clinical product and marketing manager at Fujifilm Middle East Africa. Actually, uh, they were the cornerstone in introducing the concept of artificial intelligence at the radiology department at Cairo University and paved the way for a new era of prosperity in the detection of breast cancer. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you uh, for the speaker, Professor Shelby and Professor Sahar for your illustrative uh, lecture. And now we start the uh, session of discussion. Dear Dr. Dina, would you share the question we received for this session? Dr. Dina, unmute yourself. Hey. Okay, I would like to thank our professors for their great lectures and many people would like to thank you for the excellent and wonderful talks. We have, first we will start with the questions of the panelists and the chairperson for Dr. Shelva and Dr. Sahar. Uh, Dr. Sharif, Dr. Hanan, would you like to ask any questions for Dr. Shelva and Dr. Sahar? Thank you. Uh, would you like to ask any questions for Dr. Shelva or Dr. Zahar? Thank you. You may proceed with all Dr. Hanan, would you <laughs> unmute yourself? We can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Shelva, for your uh, nice presentation. Really, uh, I learned a lot of tips. Uh, in it, I use also tomosensis. May I ask you, please, um, should we do the tomosensis in both uh, CC and MLO views um, plus 2D? Because um, sometimes, particularly for regular uh, screening patients, there is no changes. And uh, the woman just had her mammogram last year. Could we just take enough two MLOs or you see that we have to go for the complete set? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very, very good question, actually. Um, and that is a concern simply because of the, um, uh, like, you know, the 1.5 times the exposure. But like you saw in one of the cases of architectural distortion that I showed, there was an architecture of asymmetry and architectural distortion seen only in one view which was the CC view, not the MLO view. Yes. And therefore it becomes very hard for us to judge which is that patient. That patient also did not have a dense or a heterogeneously dense breast. Therefore, I, uh, uh, the more, uh, the more uh, experience that I get with CD tomosynthesis, the more I realize that it is invaluable, like uh, not as a substitute, but as a primary screening modality and in both views, that is point one. And uh, point two is, uh, 
uh, about uh, the radiation dose. That is our concern. And that's the reason we worry about doing it uh, from year to year when they come for screening. So for that reason itself, the synthetic view, the better it gets, the quality as it improves. Like we first had S view. Now we have the S view plus, the quality of which is improving uh, with every generation. And my, uh, my hope is that eventually we'll be able to give up the 2D completely and we will be able to rely on the uh, 3D tomosynthesis by, uh, with the synthetic view. Uh, so to, uh, to answer your question, um, my experience uh, uh, indicates that it is best to do the full study in 3D tomosynthesis. Okay. Is there any other questions from the chairperson? So now we will go for questions from the attendee. First for Dr. Shelva. Uh, uh, the first question is when to do tomosensis from the start? From the start for a screening study or for a diagnostic study, like I said, I do 3D tomosynthesis in all my cases, like for screening as well as diagnostic. And uh, this, is the, this is the feedback I get from a uh, uh, lot of centers who have started practicing 3D tomosynthesis in India, plus uh, the centers where I worked uh, earlier in Canada at the University of Ottawa, as well as University of Toronto. We find that uh, screening has, uh, 3D tomosynthesis has much value uh, to add, and therefore uh, it is done uh, uh, as a full study in screening as well as diagnostic setting. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shelva. The next question also for Dr. Shelva, when to go for special mammographic views? When to go for special mammographic views? So you are asking whether uh, about, uh, say, spot magnification views. Um, I find that spot magnification views for microcalcification still has great value, simply because um, uh, we use a finer, smaller focal spot, and therefore uh, the morphologic analysis of the microcalcifications is far better on those spot magnification views. So I continue to do spot magnification views for microcalcifications, like I showed in the case with Paget's disease, that was a magnified spot magnified view. It was not a digital magnified view, but a actual dedicated spot magnification view. Uh, there are um, some of my co colleagues who, uh, who like to use the spot compression 3D also, 3D uh, tomosynthesis with spot compression. And uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is beneficial too, especially because we are able to see those uh, 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 peripheral speculations far better with those spot compression views. It is available with uh, a few vendors, like Hologic has always had it. Uh, Fuji has now introduced it. And uh, yeah, unfortunately I didn't have a case to show, but uh, yes, uh, the use of the spot compression view is going down with 3D tomosynthesis way less than before. But every once in a while, we find that there is utility in using that spot compression uh, 3D tomosynthesis. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ashelva. Also, another question is uh, when I found the hamartoma, should I comment on the content inside the capsule if there is calcification or not regular density? Uh, yes. So, hamartomas uh, basically have anything that a normal breast tissue could have, like a fat fibroglandular tissue. So just like a normal breast tissue could have normal microcalcification, uh, like a normal, uh, like, you know, benign calcification, a hamartoma could also have benign calcification. But be cognizant of the fact that it is breast tissue at the end of the day. So sometimes malignant or pre-malignant uh, changes could happen within that hamartoma also. So remember to analyze or assess that content of the hamartoma like you would assess any of the breast tissue. Okay, very informative. Is a last question, Dr. Shelva. What is cystic fibroadenoma and what is its grade according to the virus? Um, pardon me, can you please repeat the question? What is cystic fibroadenoma and what is its grade according to the virus? Cystic fibroadenoma. Fibroadenoma. Uh, fibroadenoma. Uh, what is cystic fibroadenoma? Cystic fibroadenoma. Uh, like, you know, there is uh, yes. like, a fi like a fibroadenoma is a fibroadenoma. If at the biopsy, we have a, a diagnosis of uh, a calcifying fibroadenoma or a hyalinized fibroadenoma, 
or just plain simple fibroadenoma then uh, it is a it is a benign fibroadenoma the type of fibroadenomas which are considered high risk or b3 lesions are cellular fibroadenomas if at biopsy the histopathology report says cellular fibroadenoma or cellular fibroadenoma versus colloidal tumor then it becomes a b3 or a high risk lesion and it requires a surgical excision yeah there is uh, there is no uh, uh, histopathology diagnosis of cystic fibroadenoma it would be a cellular fibroadenoma which would be concerning okay thank you dr silva for your informative discussion and amazing lectures and amazing discussion the thank next you very question much. will be for dr sahar mansoor thank you uh, the next question will be for dr sahar mansoor Uh, does artificial intelligence include both morphological and functional data, and how? Actually, this is still under debate. According uh, to all the papers that have been published before, they are only for detection of the lesions, respective cancer or not. It detects the lesions and gives us the view. What? Uh, give us a hue of color. Uh, nothing, Dr. Sahar. Okay, they give us a hue of color, and okay. there's nothing about the. Uh, they... There is nothing about the abnormality scoring to discriminate okay. dimer. Not... This is only a part of our research in Osir uh, Um If you go through the actual paper that have been published before, they only uh, talk about the presentation and the morphology of the lesion, or the, if there is abnormality scoring to discriminate whether between benign and malignant masses, there is no such thing. Actually, it's only commercially used for detection of the cancer and not for discrimination between the lesion. This is the first time okay. to to be such thing in uh, in our department. Okay. Another question um, about the technique of artificial intelligence: Is it a software or what? It's a software or and what? If it is a software, it is available in all digit. Uh, it is a software, and uh, if it is a software, it is available on all digital mammography machines, or it is a separate unit. No, it's a separate unit. It has its own server, its uh, its own PC, its own monitor, its own fax. Uh, it's different. So you actually you may have it with the digital mammogram. It's another. Uh, um, um, it's another. Uh, according to another company, it's not probably to have the same AI in uh, in our department. We have the Fujifilm uh, AI, and uh, it could work with any other commercial item. It doesn't need to be Fujifilm. Uh, mammogram to work with it. Actually, it's very friendly and could scan the mammograms from any other company uh, in the market. Uh, it's a machine by itself, not a software to be superimposed on the digital mammogram device. Okay, last question, Dr. Sahar. In case of high abnormality score and negative ultrasound, should I proceed for functional imaging or negative ultrasound is reassuring? No, of course, of course, I'm going to go for functional imaging, MRI or contrast enhanced mammogram, and even my me use uh, uh, tomosensors as well, uh, because uh, the ultrasound is operator dependent. Most of the cases, if the lesion is goes with the architect of the breast, it's uh, very indiscernible from the related glandular tissue. It's not that obvious to us. Uh, we need further modality that based on the functional evaluation of the lesion, not just the morphology. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sahar. Thank you, Dr. Shelva. There is no more questions. And at the end of the session, I would like to thank my professors for their great, informative, wonderful talks and discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dina, for the wonderful session. I would like to thank all the participants from all around the world. We are still streaming live from the studio from the 13th PGICC virtual platform. We will just go for a break for two minutes and we will back with the third session of the day. Stay tuned.